Rewatch Podcast presents The Naked Gun Rewatch. Join us for some bonus episodes as we revisit these films in a smaller film franchise. Send your feedback to the Rewatch Podcast at gmail.com. Join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash rewatchpodcast or follow us on Twitter at rewatchpod. Today we're discussing The Naked Gun 2 and a half, The Smell of Fear, starring Leslie Nielsen, Priscilla Presley, George Kennedy, O.J. Simpson, Robert Goulet, <laughs> okay... Richard Griffiths, and a a tiny part by Weird Al Yankovic, and directed again by David Zucker. Welcome back to the Rewatch Podcast. I'm Corey, and we got that model D83 Swedish short grip suck machine in that you ordered. (laughs) And uh, this is Nathan, and if you only see one movie this year, you ought to get out more often. (laughs) <laughs> pulling lines from the trailer i know i know i know i know i i, I kind of thought i'd step outside of the box and that's not saying there's a lack of quality of lines in the movie this is that line that stuck with me a little bit i just quite, I quite liked it <laughs> how are you mate yeah fantastic i was watching this movie how could you not mate? i know <laughs> i know these 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 are these are good ones but um how about we just go straight to the trailer yeah Let's do it. Let's do it. Washington, D.C., where violence explodes every day. But America's toughest cop is pounding a new beat. Lieutenant Drebber. The police squad is back. Please! Is this some kind of bust? Very impressive, yeah. They're ready for action. How you doing, Trooper? Ready for love. I'm lonely, I'm lost, I need someone to hold, to love. Frank, over here. And ready for seconds in the movie that proves you can lead a cop to water, but you can't make him think. The water's over there, Frank. Starring Leslie Nielsen. I don't recall seeing your name on the guest list. Nothing to be embarrassed about. I sometimes go by my maiden name. If it's not dangerous, he's not interested. Priscilla Presley as the irrepressible Jane. Robert Goulet as Quentin Habsburg. The truth hurts, doesn't it, Habsburg? Oh, sure. Maybe not as much as jumping on a bicycle with a seat missing, but it hurts. George Kennedy as Captain Ed Hawken. Congratulations. I understand that Ed is pregnant again. Yes, and if I catch the guy who did it. And O.J. Simpson as Nordberg. Step on it. If you only see one movie this year, you ought to get out more often. The Naked Gun 2 and a half. The Smell of Fear. Give me the strongest thing you got. This is a sequel so big, they had to add another half. Welcome back. Yes, let's get into the trivia. Yes. The Naked Gun 2.5 was released on June 28th, 1991. And The Naked Gun 2.5, The Smell of Fear, I might add, actually knocked Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, from the top spot at the box office at the time. It actually took in $86.9 million in its 1991 domestic release, which adjusted to $2015 is $179 million. It was actually against a reported budget of $23 million. And it was actually the 10th best performing movie of 1991 not bad i know and when you actually think about it man like robin hood pins of thieves that film was huge absolutely I'm, huge I'm, I'm talking like almost i'm not going to use the word avatar but it wasn't like like when you really do take it back to 1991 that movie was so big it was i, I remember that film just being 
absolutely everywhere. Yeah, and it's interesting that this is you know, a sequel to a spoof comedy. That first one must have really struck a nerve with people because it seems they were coming out in droves to catch the sequel in the theatre. I know, and like to think about like Naked Gun brought in $89 million domestically. I mean, Robin Hood at the time took in $165 million domestic and another 225 foreign off a budget of $48 million, taking it to $390 million dollars back in 1991 those are huge dollars just absolutely ginormous and um you're dead right for a small sequel of a goofball comedy essentially to knock it off its perch was actually quite a big deal exactly and we talked about it back with police academy i mean they did all right for the first few but none of the sequels ever outgrossed that first one like that first one was the the big thing and then it just slowly dropped off down by the time it got to number seven Mm, yeah no you did right and another thing i noticed about this film too is that it's actually written by david zucker but it's also co-written by a guy named pat proft who was behind the original police academy Mm. film he was one of the original writers on that and if i remember rightly i think he got a credit on all six of the sequels so he probably would have made some cash off that franchise and this one at the same time yeah, definitely. A, a nice uh, little tie-in to go with the fact that this is a bonus to the Police Academy series. That's exactly right. Another bit of trivia here. For those who don't know, I mean, we're a fair bit removed from it now, but the opening sequence ends with Zsa, Zsa Gabor slapping the police car. And she says, uh, she comes out and she says, this happens every time I fucking go shopping. <laughs> And <laughs> she goes, this is actually a reference because in 1989, Zsa, Zsa Gabor was actually arrested yeah, for yeah. slapping a police officer and driving with an expired license. Yeah, I know. And she was quite <laughs> infamous for being difficult, wasn't mm. she? I mean, yeah. she I mean, she was kind of a big star in her own right back in, I think, the, the 60s and 70s, I think it was, more predominantly. Mm. I actually don't really know what she's famous for. I should kind of look her up, truthfully. But yeah, I, she, she was kind of famous for being famous, if you know what I mean. Yeah, like an early version of the Kardashians or something. Yeah, a little bit like that. Like she, she was kind of like a very glamorous older woman who kind of was obviously a, a, a bit of a poster girl back in the day and didn't really want to leave her looks behind her. She always kind of tried to retain them, didn't she? Exactly, you know, just rich and uh, you know through parties and stuff with mm. you know Hollywood elite and whatnot. So she was famous for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another kind of random thing that happens in there. There's a Canadian actor named Lloyd Bockner who actually spoofs his own performance in the famous 1962 episode of The Twilight Zone, which was entitled "To Serve Men." Now, to put this into perspective, this I know this sounds like a bit random, but there's actually, and I actually did notice it as I was watching it. There's a crowd sequence towards the end of the film, if I remember rightly. This guy runs across scene with this ginormous book in front of him that says to serve men and yelling the words it was just a cookbook it's a cookbook which is the shocking reveal in the original twilight zone episode so david zucker and pat proft i should say must have been fans to include him randomly in the uh, naked gun two and a half sequel i actually watched that episode of the twilight zone not too long ago because the whole series is up on netflix so i kind of just found a list of like all the best twilight zone episodes and watched them and that one is on there and yeah this the whole thing is they find this book and you know they they think because it's called to serve man that this guy is killing and cooking okay. people interesting but it's really just like a butler's guide you know how to cook food for men it had something to do with aliens as well okay no. I, I actually bought the original twilight zone on blu-ray i've got all five seasons like every episode nice. in, in high def and i get the concept of not of not buying everything but as far as like those old shows like those rescanned 4k negatives like they're nice they're really and like it really looks pristine like it's it's, it's a really beautiful to watch and some of those episodes are great all right so another bit of trivia the atomic device, which is at the end, the one that uh, Frank and Jane are trying to defuse, is the actual screen used device from the 1964 James Bond movie Goldfinger. Wow, there you go, eh? Reusing a prop there. Bit random, but that's okay. <laughs> Weird Al Yankovic actually has a brief role as a thug who holds the police at the precinct at gunpoint. In the scene, he actually says, Okay, pigs, say your prayers, followed by Frank slamming the door open and knocking Yankovic's character to the floor. Yankovic said it took more than 20 takes to get the scene done, and that after about 16 takes, his leg had turned a nice shade of purple. The stunt coordinator actually asked Yankovic at that point if he wanted to 
wear some padding. And Yankovic also recalled that O.J. Simpson actually felt sorry for him. It's a good scene. It's actually a reused gag from the Police Quad series. They actually do use a, a couple of gags from the series in this one. The other ones include, well, the ones that I spotted at least, include the uh, the outlines that the cops put around where yeah, a dead yeah, body yeah. was. And it's got the Egyptian like hieroglyph on the floor. Yep. Another reused gag. And the fact that the door of Police Squad has, I, th- I think it's police, which is inverted because you're looking at it from yep. the inside of the glass. But Squad is still, it's, the right way. <laughs> it's still the right way around. Nice. Yeah. Funny little background gag, but still good. But this, this is not the only time they slam a door and it knocks somebody out in this film as well because they don't they use the gag at the start of the film with Barbara Bush? Barbara as Bush. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. good. Yeah, exactly. But we'll get to that. The number of Jane's apartment is 3D for some random reason. No way. Uh, the love scene between Leslie Nielsen and Priscilla Presley involving a pottery wheel is a send-up of a very famous movie from 1990 called Ghost, which if, I mean, I can't imagine there'd be many people that wouldn't have heard of the film Ghost, you know, in saying that they're spoofing that film at the time, aren't they? It's Patrick Swayze into me more, and mm. she's making a, a pot on a pottery wheel, and he's a ghost because he's died. Yeah, I know. And he kind of, like, wraps his arms around her while she's, like, doing the clay pot. The movie's actually directed by Jerry Zucker, who is the brother yes. of David Zucker. Wow. They... And uh, Jerry also co-wrote the Police Squad series with his brother as well, so... Okay, interesting. He wraps around and makes sense why he would spoof his own brother's movie. Wow. That, <laughs> I mean, that, again, talking about, like, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, like, Ghost, that was another ginormous hit as well. And, mm. and like, I, I kind of wonder, like, is that a legit legitimately good film if you watched it today i kind of like have you seen that film i've seen it not in a very long time though but it is yeah probably one of the most like famous romance films of the 90s yeah yeah yeah, yeah. very sad well, Whoopi goldberg won a cat won a uh, academy award for it didn't she i don't remember i think she did maybe uh, she yeah. did she is one of the better parts of the movie if i remember i think she that is the I think that is the film that she kind of started to be taken seriously as an actor. It's true. Before that, she was doing like Jumping Jack Flash and yeah, Burper and stuff. Yeah, like, yeah, that's exactly dodgy right. movies. Yeah. Well, you're a little off topic there, but <laughs> it's okay. In this movie, we have Robert Goulet, and uh, he is. <laughs> The fact that he's in this movie is funny because he was actually a special guest star in the Police Squad series. Now, for those who haven't seen Police Squad, the opening credits always (laughs) introduce the main cast, Leslie Nielsen and I think it was Alan North who plays Ed. In the in the series, it's a different actor here in, in this one. It's uh, George, George 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 Kennedy. George Kennedy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they would introduce them, but the thing is that they would go, you know, starring Leslie Nielsen, and then he'd get into a gunfight, and then Alan, <laughs> and they'd be like, now Alan North, and he's in the precinct, right? But he gets in a gunfight anyway, and there's people <laughs> running around on fire. Oh my lord! And then they'd introduce this random actor who's not in the show, who's playing Abraham Lincoln, and he gets shot at in the theater, so he turns around and gets into a gunfight. <laughs> oh wow! And then they introduce Deuce, the special guest star of the episode, who gets in a gunfight and immediately dies. <laughs> they had all kinds of people, including Robert Goulet. I think Shatner's was the best. Yeah, yeah. Well, Shatner's in a booth and he, people start shooting at him and he shoots back, but he wins the gunfight. Oh my God. So it's like, hey, William Shatner won the gunfight, but then he immediately drinks poison and dies. Wow. <laughs> wow. Great little sequences. Again, people, if you haven't oh, seen the Police Squad series, just go and watch it that's so go. funny oh it's hilarious dude I should really try and uh, kind of revisit those police squad kind of TV shows I've, I've, I've never done them I, I, I need to watch them they're out online for free mm-hmm. at dailymotion.com okay. just go and watch them so good a bit of a goof towards the end of the film when Frank is actually trying to disarm the bomb the timer shows 159 then flashes 209 in a later shot so continuity kind of mucked that up a little bit but you know whatever I'm, I'm, I'm not a big guy that looks out for goofs in movies I just t- tend to accept what's happening and just move on yeah especially for this movie who oh, cares <laughs> totally and you know what? I actually looked there was quite a few goofs in it and I just chose I just chose one of them so it's alright <laughs> this is another thing that actually that I found interesting as well is that in the opening scene Captain Bromford mentions that Frank's rank is lieutenant when Frank begins his open narration he mentions his rank as sergeant this is not an error 
but a running joke in the series that comes from the original Police Quad TV show, where Drebin would be referred to as several different ranks through an episode of even in the same sentence. Frank's full official title is Sergeant Frank Drebin, <laughs> Detective Lieutenant Police Squad. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a fictional amalgamation of three different ranks of a police officer. <laughs> I never knew that. That's hilarious. <laughs> Just looking at it and reading it back makes you laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, the, and you know the the best thing about it, man, is that you just know that when it's said, it's done so sincerely. I, I think that's the key to the, that's the, it's the key to the success of all these kind of comedies is just how sincerely and serious the actors take the silliness. It's so over the top silly, and it's so funny. But all the actors just they treat the the sort the material with such respect. It's very good. Some of them are really obvious, yeah. yeah. But then others like his official rank just pass you by if you're really not really paying attention yeah yeah but that is great sergeant frank Revan, detective lieutenant anyway that's it for the trivia mate that i yeah. could find that i could find anyway i'm sure well let's more get into there. the movie shall we yeah let's do it all right so a nice little opener again i think we, we get this for all three you know just a nice little opener to sort of set the tone for the movie if you will and this time he's actually at a presidential dinner and uh this is 1991 so it's president george bush and uh <laughs> They're introducing people here, and then the president comes in with Barbara Bush, his wife. <laughs> keep, keep, in, keep in mind, you don't see Frank for quite some time, do you? Exactly. They go through this whole thing. And then as the president and his wife are walking down, in walks Frank, just slams the door <laughs> right into Barbara Bush's face, setting <laughs> her flying. The president does, doesn't even notice. Yeah, I know. <laughs> It's really great. Oh. I do like the fact that they use a sitting president at the time, but also, too, it kind of like, oh, man, using a reference from Ghost that we kind of mentioned earlier on and George Bush at the time, it kind of ages the film considerably into, like, a bit of a box. Like, unless you remember these people, the gag isn't as funny. Yeah, I can agree. It really does set it in a specific time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very much so, where they didn't necessarily need to use George Bush, but they chose to do it for just for a gag. I mean... Let's let's be honest, he's probably not very hard to make fun of. Yeah, exactly. But the you know, the actors they get to do it, they're really good, right? Oh, totally. Like they're really good. They're really good impersonators and they look like them and that and they pull it off really well. So yeah, so like back to the story. Drebin is kind of at this presidential dinner where the president is about to announce some kind of new initiative that the government is kind of going to instill within the uh the laws of the land and he's announced that he's going to be using the recommendations for the country's energy program from a very renowned scientist named Dr. Albert Meinheimer. And we get introduced to him pretty quickly. He's actually played by the very famous British actor Richard Griffiths. Yes, I guess more recently people would recognise him from Harry Potter. Yeah, yeah, totally. He, he played um, Dursley, who was uh, yes. Harry's, Harry's uncle. Yes, that's, and he, was, he played it very well. I mean, he to yeah. be to be fair, he's he's been in a lot of other things. He's he's not just known for for Harry Potter. I mean, he's kind of been in obviously, as you say, the Harry Potter. He's in Hugo as well, the History Boys, mm -hmm. um, Sleepy Hollow. He was in the uh, Tim Burton version, I should say. He was in the uh, that Guarding Tess film. Wasn't it Nicolas Cage? Yeah, is, is that the one that I'm thinking yeah, of? Yeah, I King, think so. He was in King Ralph. With John Goodman. Oh God! He was also, he was also in With Now and I. Oh yeah, 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 yeah With yeah. Now and I. I remember yeah. that now. Gandhi, yeah. uh, French Lieutenant's Woman, Chariots of Fire, Superman Two. He was in. <laughs> he's he's terrorist number three in wow. Superman Two. So so like I mean this guy's kind of been around definitely, and he's he's a very well respected actor. So the fact that mm. he's actually taken on the uh, Naked Gun is, is is quite good. Yeah, work at his mm -hmm. com yeah. comedic chops yeah. in yeah. a way. <laughs> Keep in mind, too, before we actually get to meet Dr. Albert Meinheimer, there's this gag where Frank is kind of at the dinner and there's this dignitary kind of standing up trying to give a speech about nuclear energy or whatever it is. And Frank is like, isn't he eating like crab or something like that? Yeah, it's, it's like a lobster, I think. Yeah, it's kind of like smash it open and stuff. 
yeah, he's smashing it open and he's being really crass about it and loud and obnoxious and totally not aware of anybody else but himself. And it's they actually go on with it for quite a while. Yeah, they do. There's like a one point where he's like trying to like scoop the flesh out of the lobster and the claw has gone up. So what whenever he's moving it, yep. this claw is pinching down and it pinches the oh. conditioner right on the boob. Yeah. <laughs> like, what? I know. It's very funny. So after the president announces that he's going to take their recommendations from uh, Dr. Albert Meinheimer for their new energy program, the heads of the coal and oil and nuclear industries are all horribly distressed by this fact because they realize that um, if Dr. Meinheimer's uh, recommendations go forth, then their profits essentially go down, don't they? So they're going to conspire to maybe have Dr. Meinheimer not give his speech? Somehow, yes. But the thing is that the president still needs a recommendation on what to do about the country's energy reserves, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. And there's like this whole revolving plot point where there's the, like this speech that happens like two thirds of the way through the film by Dr. Mannheimer where he kind of gives his recommendations and the whole film kind of leads to that point a little bit. What they do is they actually find a guy who looks like Dr. Meinheimer. Mm. And they're going to do like a switch. Yeah, so yeah. their Dr. Meinheimer will recommend that they stay with nuclear, coal, oil, all that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. then, then the president will just go with that, right? That's yeah, their yeah. big plan. But first they need to, I guess, maybe get Dr. Meinheimer out of the way. A little bit. Yeah, so yeah, they, yeah. they hire this guy to drop a bomb off at the research lab. Yes. And it turns out that his assistant is Jane. And yes. she's actually left Frank at this point. They were going to get married after the first move. <laughs> Didn't she, like, leave him at the altar or something yeah, like that? Yeah, like, they got all the way there, and then she just ran away for whatever reason. And she just keeps going on about, like, how much man he is. Like, <laughs> I exactly can't move on. I've had too much man. <laughs> and there's probably, I, I think it's probably my favourite line in the whole film when Jane and Frank finally see each other for whatever reason and Frank is kind of saying to Jane I even bought that thousand hectares of land in the Brazilian rainforest for you and then and then, and then I had it stripped just so we could build our dream house <laughs> <laughs> and then he says so, so like, like they're getting into this back and forth argument where or clearly she's upset about him kind of buying this land in the Brazilian rainforest yeah, so he goes oh, I spent all my money and he goes you try displacing a tribe see how easy that is <laughs> <laughs> they do have a like really good encounter because you know yeah the bomb goes off fortunately jane and dr meinheimer are unharmed right but of course frank gets called over there and they're actually in washington dc now yeah so he just like throws out there because he's on police squad that he can consult <laughs> with washington yeah. on this right and he's heading he's like i headed straight there from the car wash and then you get this like <laughs> It's like view of the car. It's covered in sun and a car car washer. This dude's just like hanging on. <laughs> oh my god! It's... And yeah, he shows up there, and they go through this whole thing about. <laughs> How the sketch artist can't, like, draw the description oh, of the man that she saw because, like, she's just too amazingly hot. He's just drawing pictures of her. As far as police work is concerned, every once in a while something comes up that nothing quite prepares you for. Somehow, some demented madman, probably full of self-hate, and possibly a couple of months behind in his rent, finally snapped. I'm glad you could make it, Frank. I got here as quick as I could, Ed. Oh, congratulations. I understand that Edna's pregnant again. Yes, and if I catch the guy who hey, did Captain, it... Captain, they just finished searching the building. Now, there's no sign of a break-in, and there's no money missing. Huh. Man, this is one hell of an explosion. Still trying to figure out what they used. Any other victims? Uh, you're standing on one right now, Frank. Oh, let's see. Get him out of here. Oh, this one's a real mess. Oh. Hey, everybody. Over here. Frank found another one. Do you have him, Mr. And the witnesses, Ed? There was one. A woman. Uh, she saw a man leaving just before the explosion. Maybe we should let Nordberg handle this one. No, I'd better do it while it's still fresh. Well, not now, Frank. She fainted dead away. She took a nasty knock on the head. She looks pretty bad. I'll handle it. Yes, sir. Excuse me, miss. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Now, Frank, about... not that bad. Uh, uh, She's uh, being questioned uh, over there by our sketch artist. I couldn't believe it was her. It was like a dream. But there she was, just like I remembered her. 
That delicately beautiful face and a body that could melt a cheese sandwich from across the room. And breasts that seem to say, hey, look at these. She was the kind of woman that made you want to drop to your knees and thank God you were a man. Yeah. She reminded me of my mother, all right, no doubt about it. Frank, snap out of it. You're looking at her like she was your mother, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and, then, and then they say, oh, you got to get the other sketch artist. You know, the, the guy that lives with those two blokes. <laughs> the, 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 two, the two guys, or whatever it is. Because they know he's not going to get distracted. <laughs> yeah, and, and she's... <laughs> She's like, oh, you know, I, I, I have missed you even after I left. Didn't you get my letters? And he goes, no, nope, threw them all in the fire. <laughs> she goes, oh, so you didn't get that check for $75,000 that your uncle left? <laughs> <laughs> There's some strong gags in this. I mean, I think the film, from a gag perspective, starts off perhaps a little bit too slowly because it doesn't feel too different from the first film. But then they kind of get into some new territory because I reckon this film has a lot more Frank in it. It has a lot more Jane in it, and it has heaps more George Kennedy in it than the first film did definitely yeah yeah and george kennedy gets some really good gags some solid gags as well like when uh, frank first shows up and says oh hey ed uh, uh, you know i heard that martha's pregnant again <laughs> he goes, yeah and if i find the man who did it <laughs> yeah. and there's some great some kind of stone cold kind of del- like line delivery as well with between george and and frank i think they're in in some kind of police office and they're talking about something and and george says yeah yeah something about sex and he goes no not now george or or, or whatever his name is and he's it's very funny the way he does it yeah for sure oh, after that's... frank's met with jane he decides that he needs to go to this like blues bar <laughs> that's just full of like suicidal people because <laughs> they're all so down <laughs> And it's got this woman like singing like a really heavy blues song, and the lyrics are all about like my life is over, I can't go on anymore, I'm such a loser. <laughs> Stuff like that. And it's got all these guys sitting in single tables, like all smoking cigarettes, drinking whiskey or whatever it is, and just being really down on life. And it's, it's, yeah. very, it's very funny. <laughs> all the pictures on the wall are like the Hindenburg crash and. Sh- ship sinking <laughs> so it's down stuff yeah, yeah ed shows up there they come up to take his drink order and he says oh give me something strong so they bring over like this <laughs> strong man <laughs> box, box of two <laughs> says, not that strong <laughs> <laughs> Give me a black Russian instead. And they bring over this drink with like umbrellas and stuff in it. <laughs> and it's and like, he's, talk- he's it's... talking about how his life is just like so crap because Jane's not in it. And he's too busy like sleeping with 20 year olds and having all this fun. He just wants what Ed's got, you know, see the same woman every day, sleep with the same woman for 40 years. <laughs> Ed's like foaming at the mouth because. He's just- 20 year olds and all this he's so depressed <laughs> by, the, by the realities of his life it's so it's so funny then he meets with jane because she shows up there meanwhile they do this gag too where he sees jane and she gestures him over then frank jumps to a random like table thinking it's jane's and he just starts talking out of nowhere <laughs> it's like this random guy that he's just like shocked a little bit and then Jane kind of <laughs> looks at him but just says no 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 over here you've got to come over here <laughs> and then they do like a Casablanca joke where it's Sam playing the piano <laughs> that's right <laughs> they say play our song again for all time second because oh, of course I can ding, ding dong the witch is dead <laughs> no, no 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 the other song oh my lord the best gag of the lot though she goes to slap him and he grabs oh. her hand so she goes to slap him with the other hand, so he grabs that. And then a third hand comes up and slaps him in the face. And Leslie Nielsen has this look on his face. Like, where they did just that stay come on from? him for like 10, 15 seconds of this just confused look. <laughs> what happened there? Exactly. <laughs> So yeah, so so this is all happening at the Lonely Blues Bar. It's a, such a funny gag. Meanwhile, at a meeting of the energy industry leaders who we mentioned earlier on, Habsburg, who is uh, the, the villain of the film, Robert Goulet, who we actually haven't really kind of mentioned, has, um, it's made pretty clear early in the film that he's had a thing 
with Jane. The two of them are pretty much together. And, and doesn't um, Drebin get terribly, like, um, jealous of Quentin and starts calling him, like, poopy pants and stuff like that? <laughs> yeah, Mr. Poopy Pants. They get to a scene where they're showing Frank what goes on in the facility. Oh, that's and right. I'm just, and I'm and thinking, like, why is Jane doing this? Like, isn't she, like, the executive assistant to Dr. Meinheimer? Like, <laughs> she, why does she know all this? And they do this great gag where they're going through the facility and Drebin is wearing like a hard hat and they're standing over like a drawbridge over this machine and um, Jane clearly says that all these scientists have been working on these experiments for years, absolutely years and it's crunch time for all their results and it's all about temperature and accuracy and, and whatnot and Drebin's hat falls off his head and goes into the machine down the bottom and it blows up and it causes all these problems so all their experiments are <laughs> Of null and void, and he just flees. He runs away. <laughs> he just doesn't care. Just, well, I think he does care, but he just gets himself into like these yeah. si- these situations. If I don't say anything, then nobody will notice. Yeah, that's exactly right. Anyway, so so the energy industry leaders have all kind of met up, and it's actually revealed that he, they have kidnapped Doctor Meinheimer, uh, Richard Griffiths, and found an exact double for him, Earl Hacker, who will give their recommendation to the president endorsing fossil and nuclear f- fuels, which is clearly their agenda and, and what they actually want to do. And that's basically the crux of, of what the bad guys are kind of up to in this film, isn't it? They've got to follow the leads that they've got, right? So the lead is the man that Jane saw. And they <laughs> It's another great scene. They did it in the last one, too, where they go to see the guy at the lab. I can't think of his name. Ted? Is Ted. Ted? Ted, Ted, that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it was something like that. And he's talking about, like, oh, we got this shoe print and we made a cast of it. But more extraordinary, we, we found this, like, dinosaur footprint <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and wood from Noah's Ark. <laughs> <laughs> he lays out all this stuff. But then he's just like, oh, you know, it hasn't led us to anything. But we did find his wallet just outside. Ted, can you show us those lab results you got back from the research institute? We weren't able to get any clean fingerprints, Captain. But we did find footprints outside the research institute. We made plaster casts out of them. A size nine and a half D. We're running a trace on it now. But even more interesting, Frank, we also found this single dinosaur footprint. A major find from the Paleolithic era. Anything else, Ted? Yes, about 20 feet down from that spot, we discovered ancient timbers, which we believe may be part of Noah's Ark. That's great, uh, Ted, but about the case... I'll be departing tomorrow for Boston, where I'll be delivering a major address to the American Archaeological Society. And I'm booked on Geraldo next week. You're going on Geraldo because of this? No, my wife is a transsexual Satan worshipper. But meanwhile, we'll be continuing fingerprint analysis, uh, fiber checks, DNA breakdown, hair samples... Then using the microscopic dirt particles on this footprint, it's a matter of getting a geologic breakdown of the entire city. We may not have that kind of time, Ted. Then maybe this will help. We found his wallet on the curb outside the Institute. We haven't yet had a chance to examine it thoroughly. It just came down from the lab an hour ago. Hector Savage from Detroit. Hey, I remember this bug. Ex-boxer. His real name was Joey Chicago. Oh, yeah. He fought under the name of Kid Minneapolis. Hey, I saw Kid Minneapolis fight once in Cincinnati. No, you're thinking of Kid New York. He fought out of Philly. He was killed in the ring in Houston by Tex Colorado. You know, the Arizona assassin? Yeah, from Dakota. I don't remember if it was north or south. North. South Dakota was his brother from West Virginia. You sure know your boxing. Well, all I know is never bet on the white guy. You got an address in there? Well, I've got a card that says Monique Di Carlo, 210 Blackman Street. That's the red light district. Wonder why Savage is hanging out down there. Sex, Frank? Uh, no, not right now, Ed. Uh, we got work to do. <laughs> <laughs> so this leads them to this guy called Hector Savage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who used to be a boxer. And another great gag where they're going through, like, Kid Minneapolis from 
South Dakota. <laughs> Isn't that the scene where that woman shows up and says, says is this a bus? And she goes, yes. It, it, it doesn't, Frank goes, yes. It's, it's very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> they track his van to a, a sex toy shop. <laughs> have a great encounter with like the woman that is trying to hide him, which leads to a chase where Nordberg <laughs> That's right. to put a tracker on the car and he keeps getting pushed under all these other cars. Yeah. <laughs> Finally ends up under a bus that takes him to Detroit. It's kind of a shame O.J. Simpson's kind of acting career didn't really go much forward after these films because he's actually pretty good in these films. Like, he actually does have some comedy chops and he's not in these films heaps, but when he does show up, he's reasonably funny. Yeah, I agree. He is actually pretty good and it's not like he's in the movie a lot. He comes in for a no. few gags and then leaves. He probably did about <laughs> as much in this movie as he did in the last like, one. I'm in the last movie, he was in a coma for a big portion of it. He gets stuck underneath a car and there's probably four or five gags where he just goes from car to car there's also like some like random things in the road at some point that just keep hitting him in the in the nuts yes it's always just like a traffic cone and then like a cactus or so he's oh, like no. random stuff hitting him in the nuts it's pretty good i know i know and they end up at this house where Savage is holed up with hostages and frank kind of shows up to the swat team and without thinking about it he goes to say hello to someone and like rather than just saying hello to them he kind of slaps one of them on the back <laughs> and he starts shooting <laughs> yeah and then he, he decides he's gonna go and get savage out by using a tank <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that's what ed says to him he goes frank you can't use that tank you haven't signed it out <laughs> So if we just signed it out, he could use it. <laughs> he could use it, yeah. I know. And, they, and um... Savage is, like, ready to give up. But then Tank just <laughs> plows through the house so the guy can run off. And um, it just, like, releases a whole bunch of zoo animals as well. <laughs> he Which comes back later in the film. <laughs> the zoo animals. And he's like, isn't there, like, lions and tigers all being released onto the city and stuff? And hyenas and stuff. We'll get to it at the end. It's really good. Yeah, yeah. So Frank then takes it upon himself to drive a SWAT tank into Hector's house and allowing Hector to escape and causing more damage when he loses control of the tank and crashes into the city zoo, causing all the animals to escape. Later that evening at a party, Frank makes matters worse when he attempts to push the wheelchair-bound doctor up to the front of the room, who is not Mannheimer. It's the replacement doctor, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And uh, it's actually a pretty good gag. I... I, I like, as much as it's silly, and I know it's silly, Corey, I shouldn't laugh, but I was laughing at it. Because it's, it's really good physical comedy. Like, uh, Frank, something happens to his wheelchair, and Frank volunteers to start pushing him, even though he's kind of clearly refusing. And he goes, no, 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 I insist. And then somehow the, the wheelchair falls over, and they end up, like, head to toe kind of thing, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> and and it goes like all across the room and then flies out of the room and they do this gag where the wheelchair kind of flies out of the hotel room and it goes across the moon like E. T. style. <laughs> <laughs> Just randomly. Just randomly. <laughs> yeah. But he ends up getting, like, a fair bit of information here. He has a bit of a dance with Jane. Oh, that's and right. And instead of, like, just doing, like, a slow dance or something like that, they're, like, doing the tango or the samba or yeah. something. <laughs> <laughs> so when they cut away, it's Robert Goulet standing there looking at them. And they've obviously, like, switched them out with, like, professional dancers. So they're doing this, like, full, like, acrobatic style yeah. dance <laughs> in the background while he's talking away. And they're having this very serious conversation throughout it as well about like Mannheimer and, and whatever they're kind of talking about and it's impossible not to laugh because the, the dance is so ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> and you know what you're right they do cut away to some doubles but like, there's a good portion of the dance when there's not when it's actually Leslie Nielsen and Priscilla Presley doing the dance and it's very intricate kind of moves like they would have had to memorise that it's pretty funny yeah exactly and I think shooting it you know if you reset to another shot you know they've got to hit their dialogue just so as they're doing all these moves because it is a quite an in intricate dance they're not just slow dancing here yeah yeah, yeah you know I, I think it would have taken a lot to shoot that scene yeah but Frank actually catches on to something early on in this scene as well where they're having dinner and Mannheimer comes up to Frank 
and he doesn't remember him. And Frank kind of catches on and goes, well, hang on a second, something's a bit wrong here because Jane told me that this was a brilliant scientist who had a photographic memory. How could he not remember me? I mean, he didn't, he met him twice. I think he met him at some dinner and then somewhere else. And the fact that he shows up here and doesn't remember him, he's kind of, a light goes off in his head to say something's not right. So he, he actually goes to see Jane at her apartment and <laughs> she has a couple of weird gags here. There's a scene where she's feeding the cat. And oh, then that's she's, right. Yes. She feeds the dog and the fish and then she's got chickens and pigs and stuff. Are they all called like scruffy and fluffy and toughy <laughs> yeah. and stuff like that? <laughs> <laughs> just random things yeah. and then frank shows up there and uh she's <laughs> she invites him in she goes oh, i'm just making a protein shake but the shake's got like a banana and then like like blood sausage and <laughs> all kinds of just gross stuff she puts in this thing and uh of course quentin has sent his hitman hector survives to come and kill her yeah, 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 yeah. So she's in the shower and she's singing, and she, Savage can't help but like join in. On she's this singing. Song. She's singing memories, isn't she? Yeah, <laughs> and it obviously like triggers something in Savage's brain, and he gets a bit teary, doesn't he? Yeah. So he and um, Frank get in this big fight, which ends with Frank attaching the fire hose to his mouth. <laughs> 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 out in the hallway so he just like rushes back into jane's apartment all you hear is this big bang yeah yeah <laughs> and, he's, and she goes oh my god what happened out there and he goes oh nothing but i probably wouldn't leave until they've had a chance to shampoo the cup <laughs> <laughs> exactly so the, the, like obviously all this is kind of happening he's kind of convinced jane that that something's amiss with uh dr Mannheimer, and it actually forces jane and frank to well it doesn't really force but it kind of connects them again and they actually rekindle their uh, their previous romance yeah and again more gags they switch <laughs> they do a shot of her pushing her hands up his torso <laughs> and they've swapped out leslie nielsen <laughs> with like this buff oil body <laughs> <laughs> muscles everywhere kind of thing yeah <laughs> and like we'll say to the trivia they do this ghost parody oh um, yeah <laughs> there's a random part actually where she reaches down his pants Pulls out more clay because it's gone everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> one handed, she somehow molds an ashtray out of it. You're like, <laughs> and then then they accidentally put their foot on the pedal of the clay, and it goes like it causes this ginormous space, like absolutely. <laughs> and meanwhile, Frank and Jane are still in this like passionate embrace, regardless of the mess. It's very funny. Yeah, they, and they do the old gag of like equating sex to like other images. So it's like a rocket taking off, yeah, that's off right. fireworks, train <laughs> going in a tunnel, all this stuff. So the next day police squad actually stakes out hexagon oils headquarters where dr Mannheimer is actually being held frank tries to go undercover into the building but instead is discovered and tied up by his henchmen the rest of the police squad actually return after a snafu and free both frank and dr Mannheimer and head to the press club dinner to try and intercept earl finding their only way in locked frank ed nordberg and dr Mannheimer commandeer a mariachi's pants costume and head in and that that sequence actually is actually actually pretty funny actually the whole thing about breaking into the headquarters i thought was pretty good this whole thing with him going to scuba dive <laughs> like <laughs> swim across and he's trying to put on these like scuba pants and it snaps off into the water and then falls down like <laughs> <laughs> Where there's about 10 other scuba pants. Like, he's been trying to put on a pair of scuba pants. Like, <laughs> he must be going for like 20 minutes or I something know. and just losing these pants. And then he finally gets into all the gear and he fall, He goes over the boat and then goes the wrong way or something like that and hurts himself. And, and George Kennedy and Nordberg step over and um, to go to the water's the other side. Yeah. And then, of course, he swims through sewage, which leads to a great gag because he has. Oh. I'm oh, sorry, can I just say something? I just really, really forgot. Like, you know how last film I was kind of making fun of um, the fact that um, Frank and Nordberg were like best friends? <laughs> it just makes me laugh for some reason. <laughs> There's a great gag earlier in the film when I think Frank is at Jane's house and Jane says, I think Frank's trying to leave and he goes, I'm sorry, Jane. I, pro I promised Nordberg I'd go over to his house and cook brownies with him. <laughs> so he goes yeah, I, I, I promised him i'd go cook brownies or something like that you know and it just it, oh it's so random it's so it's so ridiculous <laughs> 
<laughs> that is a good gag. So yeah, he's breaking into this building, right? And he has this phrase that he's going to say so they know when to move in. And the phrase is, I love it. So oh, he gets yeah. captured and they're tying him up and they go, oh, what's that smell? <laughs> and he says, well, I was swimming in raw sewage. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it's 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 so silly, isn't it? Just a few side gags, you know, he's trying to break the rope that he's tied up with by, you know, rubbing against this uh, set of shells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. all this stuff keeps falling on Dr. Meinheimer. <laughs> it's like real heavy things too, like bowling balls. Yeah, like clearly hurt again. Pool balls, an anvil comes down, a whole thing of oil falls on him, and then packing beans go all over him. Oh my god. They finally bust in to save Frank. Well, Ed comes in, he goes, Oh my god, look what they've done to Dr. Meinhammer, those animals. Yes. <laughs> they catch the guy who was watching them. <laughs> and he throws his badge down, he's like, I'm just junk you public now, you're gonna get what's coming to you. And then they cut away to everyone's reactions as this fight's going on. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And Frank is like, Okay, that's enough that's enough i think he's had enough there and they cut back and ed's just on the floor the guy's beating the shit out of him <laughs> get that captain up we gotta get out of here i know i know it's good isn't it so that they quickly divulge fairly quickly that quentin is like the mastermind behind everything but before frank can kind of uh, get him they actually he reveals that he has one more trick up his sleeve where he's actually rigged the building with a small nuclear device that will kill everyone in there except for him and uh, render Dr. Meinheimer's speech useless. As Frank actually gains the upper hand and is about to get the disarming code, Ed enters and throws Quentin out a window. On his way down, he hits an awning and he's able to come to the sidewalk unscathed, but he's immediately met by a lion and devoured. <laughs> <laughs> Such a like slow burn of a gag. The fact that all those animals escape from the zoo. Yeah. So he comes down, just bounces off the awning, and he's like all good. And you're like, what the hell? This lion just comes out of nowhere and attacks him. I know. Oh my god, it's, it's very, so good. It's so good. So Frank actually frees Jane from being handcuffed to the bomb, and they attempt to disarm it while Nor Ed and Nordberg go back into the ballroom to evacuate it. After several failed attempts, Frank finally manages to disarm the bomb at the very last second by tripping over the power cord, unplugging it. I actually like that. I thought it was funny. It made me laugh. It, I didn't expect it because there was, you know, there was all this kind of stuff with the bomb. You knew it was going to go off, but the fact that he just tripped over the power cord, it, it, it was quite good. Wake up! Wake up! For God's sake, wake up! Wake up for the blow! Wake up! That the gun Wake up! Designed, I'll get the lights. National Energy Plan. Now, to elaborate on point 102. Here, read this. It's an emergency. His strong, manly hands probed every crevice of her silken femininity. Their undulating bodies writhing in sensual rhythm as he thrust his purple-headed warrior into her quivering mound of love pudding. All right, listen up, everyone. I want you to calmly file towards the exit. That's it, that's it. Nobody run, just walk. Single file. That's it. Now, if we just stay calm, no one's going to be harmed by the huge bomb that's going to explode any minute. <laughs> It's a cookbook! It's a cookbook! And then it's all well that ends well. I mean, the president wants to actually promote Frank. He actually wants to create a whole new department for Frank to lead called the Federal Bureau <laughs> of Police Squad. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> keep, keep in mind... This is like a guy that they tried to reward earlier in the film, like right at the start of the film at that at that dinner for like his thousandth drug bust or hundredth drug bust or something like that. And doesn't he say something like, oh yeah, the last two I just reversed over in my car and they just <laughs> happened to be drug dealers. <laughs> I caught a lucky break there. And George Bush just looks at him and he's like, oh, like really? <laughs> <laughs> 
So good. But yeah, he, he doesn't take the job. He, he doesn't want to do it because pretty much like Jane was saying, her whole thing for not marrying him was that he was already married to the job as yeah. a cop. So he says, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm going to stop being a cop and I'm going to marry Jane and we're going to have little Frank Jr. and the whole world will be good. And that's basically kind of what happens. They they go to out to a bank where they accept accept commendations from the crowd. Um, Frank spins around and accidentally knocks Barbara Bush off onto the edge. She manages yeah. to hold on, although in an attempt to help her, Frank pulls off her dress. <laughs> Poor Barbara Bush. They really don't treat her very well in this film, do they? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, pretty good. And that's basically the film, man. Like, there's there's not that much more to discuss. I mean, it's a reasonably well, it's not really complicated plot per se, but a but a fair amount happens. It's still funny, you know. Oh, definitely. So, uh, what about uh, ratings and recommends? Oh, this is this is a strong recommend for me. I, I love this film. I, I, I think it just made me laugh from start to finish. I think it's better than the first one. You know, I think this is a, a 90s comedy classic. No question. Anyone that's got a funny bone in their body that can watch silly comedy, because this is not serious at all. This is very, very silly, tongue-in-cheek. But as I said to you before, like it, it all comes down to the, the actors treating the material seriously and allowing those laughs to kind of come through. And Leslie Nielsen is just so funny. And surround, like George Kennedy, Priscilla Presley, um, Robert Goulet, Richard Griffiths, none of these actors are lightweights at all. And they really know what they're doing. So when you have such a good pedigree, it's, it's not a, a big surprise that a quality film kind of appears, and, and they certainly got it here. So yeah, so, so from my perspective, this is a strong recommend. I'm probably going to give it eight and a half Mannheims out of ten. I love it. I, I, I really liked it quite a lot. Yeah, and I'm there with you. It's a very funny, very quality film. I don't think I'll agree with you on it being better than the first one. I still think I like that first one better, but I'm still splitting fine hairs here. Yeah, I mean, it's it's yeah. still a very, very I agree. funny movie. I give it a strong recommend. So I think I'll give it... Uh, eight clay ashtrays. <laughs> I like it. Ted the clay ashtray. It's good. <laughs> All right. So next episode, we will be discussing The Naked Gun 33 and a third, mm -hmm. the final insult. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm really looking forward to that. The last one. Yes, wrapping this set up before we get into the surprise of what's next. For some reason, I kind of thought that maybe Priscilla Presley wasn't in the third one, but I just looked it up and she is, so it's good. Yeah, so, so, ja so Jane is back. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure they get back all the uh, regular players, including Weird Al. Really? Yes. <laughs> and I think Weird Al wow. goes back to playing himself. Again, yeah. so. well, one thing I will say, and I think I mentioned it earlier on, the, the only thing that draws back this film is just the pop culture references of the time. As we just said, it kind of places this movie into a bit of a box where unless you're familiar with those concepts, it's it may be not as strong as, as it kind of could be. But me and you were there, man. We, were, we remember those films. We kind of remember some of those incidents. So it still holds up from our perspective. But do you think would a teenager now like if, if a 17 year old watched this film today do you think they'd probably still appreciate it as much no maybe not because of that you know of the time aspect but i think the gags are still good yeah they're the pretty... gags still work and people can still laugh at those yeah yeah so no you're right at the end of the day the, the comedy is what's what, what what's important and yeah. it comes across in spades here for sure so um that's it for this episode of the Rewatch Podcast, keep up with listener interaction by joining our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Rewatch Podcast. Follow the show on Twitter at Rewatch Pod and visit our webpage rewatchpodcast.podomatic.com. And you can always write us an email or record a voice message and send it to the Rewatch Podcast at gmail.com. And also, if you've enjoyed the show, please consider giving us a rate and review on iTunes. That's very helpful. And you can help support the Rewatch Podcast by heading over to patreon.com slash rewatchpodcast where you can make a monthly contribution as little as a dollar. And it helps every dollar. Yeah, absolutely. Any contribution is greatly appreciated. And we're slowly growing, but we are on 
YouTube. We need mm. 100 subscribers so we can get a specific URL. But at the moment, if you just search the Rewatch podcast, maybe throw in sliders or Police Academy or something like that in your search, I'm sure you'll find us easy enough. And go ahead and subscribe. Yeah, the, definitely. More, the more people, the better. All right. Well, thank you for joining me again, Nathan. No, thank you, man. It's a, It's been an absolute blast. I, I, I don't think I've laughed this much in a while, truthfully. Like, <laughs> certainly not in any modern kind of comedies. Like, they're, they're there, there's some good ones out there, man. But this one's like these are they're funny. They just laugh a minute. Like I, I mentioned it to you last week. Like the gags are thick and fast. Like like one finishes and another one starts. Like immediately, there's another gag right there just waiting. And and uh, these films have to have them in spades. It's great. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I will just say until next time. I'm sure that we can handle this situation maturely, just like the responsible adults that we are. Isn't that right, Mister Poopy Pants? <laughs> <laughs> and throw down your guns and come on out with your hands up or come on out then throw down your guns whichever way you want to do it just remember the two key elements are here one guns to be thrown down two come on out the rewatch podcast is not associated with the copyright holders of these films and no copyright infringement is intended the use of any and all copyrighted material is only for parody, news analysis, critique, or educational purposes as provided in Title 17, a.k.a. Fair Use. Music provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Copyright 2016, The Rewatch Podcast. Hey, Rewatch Podcast listeners, I'm Corey. I'm Tom. And I'm Nathan. First off, let me say that we have all had a blast doing the Rewatch Podcast. Every week, we put out another episode for free for you. And although we enjoy these discussions with each other, we truly do this for you guys out there in podcast land. That's right, Corey. But we are here today to tell you about Patreon. Every week, there are costs involved in podcasting about film and television, including hosting and bandwidth charges, our own personal internet usage, and film or show rentals and purchases. So, we're asking you to become a Patreon supporter. If you can afford as little as $1 to throw our way per month, it would really help us keep the lights on. And if you want to send $100 our way every month, we wouldn't turn that down either. But it's your choice, and we appreciate the support you bring. As always, we strive to bring you the best quality shows we can create and we hope that you enjoy them so head on over to patreon.com slash rewatch podcast to become one of our patrons and show your support for the rewatch podcast and if we get enough patrons we may even be able to produce exclusive content just for the supporters in the form of simply getting episodes before the main feed release or even bonus film discussion episodes as a thank you for your support the website again is patreon.com slash rewatch podcast. Thanks everyone. <laughs>